Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. After you run through the news you need to know about, we're going to need to thank you where we answer Finn's fans' questions. Is a really, really good start to the offseason for the Miami Dolphins, which we will get into here in a second. But I want to start with some of the um, lesser news stories, uh, some of the speculative stuff that we've heard over the Super Bowl week. Um, obviously, a lot of people are getting together for the Super Bowl uh, that have power in the NFL, and we're, we've heard some interesting rumors that involve the Dolphins. So I wanted to go over some of that stuff. Now, this is purely speculative, but these do come from very reputable sources. Uh, that I thought was interesting. So the first one, Albert Beer was on the Dan Patrick show, and he was talking about Tua's fifth-year option, um, and he was talking about Lamar Jackson's availability. He seems to think that, and this is his, if you guys want to go watch the interview yourselves, you can, uh, but he seems to think the whole Dolphins um, picking up Tua's fifth-year option isn't a guarantee and it probably won't ha- happen that doesn't mean that they're contradicting themselves at least the Dolphins on saying that that Tua isn't is their starter for this year but he brings up the fact that Lamar Jack's availability is he's been more available than he has been in the past which is interesting I still don't think there's not a chance on this planet that Baltimore lets someone like that leave their building but Albert Breer did say in this interview that if he was to be moved the Dolphins are the number one destination for him which I thought was really interesting um so take it with what you will Albert Beer is obviously a very well respected man in the NFL he's been an insider for many years he's obviously a reporter for Sports Illustrated um this uh, obviously if the Dolphins had the opportunity to get someone like Lamar Jackson they should do it he's too young and too good not to do to 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 trade for um, he's an MVP quarterback. Mike McDaniel is a fantastic head coach. You know, Mike was around Kyle Shanahan for obviously many years. He saw what he could do with RG3. Um, and the idea of him and an, Lamar Jackson in an offense like that uh, with weapons. Now, I think some of that stuff would be toned down, but it would be very similar to what RG3 did his rookie season. I don't think it will be as much because Lamar Jackson's a much more... <clears throat> Um, he's a significantly better pocket passer than RG3 ever was. So, And clearly that's been an issue for him in Baltimore. Not only is he not getting the guaranteed money, but they have not really done a great job of evolving that offense since he's been in the league. Uh, and he's dealt with a lot of injuries because of that, the amount of times and the amount of rushing attempts and so on and so forth. So I don't. if the trade was made, I think the offense would look a little bit different. But with all the weapons around him, the play calling be, being significantly better, and the addition of Vic Vangio, which we're about to talk about, that would make the Dolphins a powerhouse. Uh, I don't. At the very least, I think we would win the division and have a home playoff game, which for <laughs> most Dolphins fans is, would be like winning the Super Bowl for other franchises. Like that would be a very, very big deal. A lot of Dolphins fans that I know haven't even seen that, haven't even seen a, a home Dolphins playoff game. So that would be you know, an amazing achievement if they were able to make a trade like that. So interesting, you know, it doesn't mean it's obviously not very concrete, but that's not the first time that I've read that in articles. Uh, But it was interesting to hear that uh, discussion when talking about Tua's option. And if Lamar Jackson was available, who would he, who would be the favorite to land him? It's interesting that he brought up the Dolphins. Uh, This next news story comes from... Well, it doesn't come for anything. It comes from a betting site, which I thought was interesting. Uh, the odds favorite, or who has the best odds to get Saquon Barkley in the offseason, is the Miami Dolphins. And if you guys watched the press conference um, with Saquon uh, after the playoff loss versus the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, clearly, and he did, obviously the prize tag is going to be significant for him. Um you know, he was talking about, you know, $16 million a year. Even that, to me, is a little much. But he is one of the best playmakers in the National Football League. And to me, that's a premium, especially in today's NFL. Uh, and I think that would really help to his health out a lot if we could really improve the run game from last year and get someone who can make something out of nothing. The blocking always doesn't have to be perfect with him. You know, he can make plays. Uh, and I honestly do feel, and especially with the injuries to Raheem Mostert, 
no, no defense, no offense against Jeff Wilson, but there were plays left out on the field in the run game, especially towards the end of the year. You know, the, there was a Jets play uh, at home that was, should have been a touchdown. There was like two or three that should have been a touchdown that weren't. There was a few times this year in the run game that I feel like there was still there was yards left to be ha- left on the field from the running back standpoint and the blocking standpoint. I, I think each kind of hurt the Dolphins. I mean, they were bottom of the league in rush average, so they were averaging like 90 yards a game in a year where the run game kind of made a comeback in a lot of ways. So, And their coach, is he, the reason he became, or he's renowned of who he is, is he was the run game corner, coordinator for the 49ers. This guy knows how to run the ball. The scheme was really fun, and I think it even innovated on what Kyle Shanahan does. Um, you know, they don't really stay stagnant with a lot of the run plays, but the staples were definitely there. Um, <clears throat> I, I think if we can get someone like Saquon, I think we can run some of those Debo plays too, uh, especially if we're able to either draft a running back, because people don't realize we actually have decent draft capital this year. It's not bad. The Dolphins definitely can get someone who's a playmaker in the run game or the pass game, or even someone who's a half-decent uh, offensive lineman prospect. We've seen a lot of those guys drop into the second round. So they have a lot of options, but in terms of free agent free agency, and I think the need for a third playmaker is really high, and the need for a run game is even higher than that to keep Tua healthy. Uh, so I think Saquon, $16 million a year is a lot. But to invest in that position, I think, is going to be really smart for them. So I thought it was interesting that they were the betting favorite to land him. I think if they were able to get someone like that, that's a that's a big-time upgrade from what they had, obviously. Um, they definitely can make the cap space for it. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of maneuverability on the in, uh, with the cap. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think, hopefully they won't get rid of any of their defensive players. Um, uh, but if they were able to land either, even Josh Jacobs or maybe they trade up to get the Texas running back. Who, and I really like this running back class too. I think it's pretty talented. I like Gibbs from Alabama a lot. So they, they could, honestly, that's probably <laughs> the more intelligent thing to do and maybe you kind of invest in the offensive line and you go young at running back I could totally see that as well uh, which I wouldn't be mad at but it's definitely something to think about uh, and getting someone like Saquon Barkley to pair a Ty- Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle would uh it, and it, it helps to a beat stay healthy because they have someone who can make plays in the backfield it doesn't all have to be in the pass on the passing game to to make big plays um, which I think honestly needs to be the focus of the off season, because uh, you know I went back and really looked at Tua's year, and it actually was better than I remember it being, um, especially because it, a lot of that had to do with him not being on the field and then how the the year ended with the quarterback play, but when he was healthy, he was really good, um, and like really really good. So it, we just gotta we gotta protect him better. Um, and make him feel more comfortable. And it doesn't have to be all on him, which I think is one of the bigger things that not a lot of Dolphins fans, and me and myself, really didn't take into account, that it was just too... It was too pass-centric. And it wasn't Mike McDaniel's fault in terms of play calling. They just couldn't consistently run the football. And, you know, someone brought this up. Uh, I think it was... I might have been watching an ESPN video. Um... So it's not my my observation, but it's a, it was a really good way to put it. And ESPN usually is terrible, but they were they were talking about how the Dolphins weren't great at methodically moving. It was a lot of explosive plays, uh, and that's true. They weren't they weren't good at putting together longer drives. You know, eight play drives, ten play drives. <clears throat> they weren't good at doing that, and they need to be. Uh, they really do to keep Tua healthy. And I think if you want him to be your long-term player, you got to realize this guy is a pocket passer. We have to build the team um, around that. And uh, we need to continue to improve that because it definitely needs to improve from a year ago. So hopefully they can add another dimension to this offense and get a, and get a, you know, a consistent run game going. And I, and I, I hope they do because I think it's a huge part. I think that should be the n- number one offseason. I think defensively... They 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 have an embarrassment of riches 
on that side of the football. They don't need to touch it. They just need to continue to be like, all right, we know Tua is talented enough to win us a Super Bowl. We have to consistently protect him so we can have him for those big games and have him, maybe he misses two games instead of six, uh, which would be a huge improvement. I think that's it for the speculative rumor stuff. We talked about the Anthony Richardson one, which was an interesting one that was reported like two weeks ago that the at least the, the front office really likes him. I really like him as a prospect. I think he's really good. But especially me sitting here and thinking about, okay, what would be the smartest thing for the Dolphins to do in the offseason? I would rather invest around Tua. The need, unless we do that in free agency. If we do that, then I wouldn't be like, I think the Anthony Richardson pick is great. But let's say we don't get a running a running back in free agency, and there's someone like Gibbs or uh, the Texas running back. His name is I can't remember right now, <clears throat> and he might be a first round pick. He's obviously very talented, but Gibbs could be there, who's also a really good uh, receiver. I would rather go that route and continue to to build around two, in my opinion, because I do think he two is trending in the right direction. <clears throat> um. What were we just talking about? We talked about the Anthony Richardson thing. I don't think there's really much else speculative to talk about that came out in the news. I I do want to say this. I've seen a lot of people say, should the Dolphins get rid of Byron Jones? That, to me, is a huge no. Uh, You know, I did see an article saying how the Dolphins want to retain Nick Needham. That was more speculative as well. Uh, I couldn't really find a hardcore source for that. Um, but I don't, I, I, and again, I don't know how much cap it would relieve. Um, I don't know the specific number, but I, I think Byron and, and especially Xavier are really going to benefit, which leads us into this next, next news story. It has been confirmed, and I did not know this, uh, the reason why Vic Vangio has been announced as the defensive coordinator, at least, is because he's a he actually is paid by the Eagles to be a consultant, which I did not know. So they were trying to kind of avoid tampering there, <clears throat> which I'm pretty sure it's illegal to talk to any of the Eagles guys this week, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, or at least leading up to the Super Bowl. You would, ha- you would have had to have done that, like I guess, before the championship games. So I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> I, I didn't did not know that. So that makes more sense, and it, it's it is literally it's confirmed because all of the other vacancies have been filled that he was linked to, like Carolina, San Francisco, even New Orleans has filled their position. So, um, so Vic is going to be a, the Dolphins' defensive coordinator, and I think the biggest benefit to this is going to be the secondary because I think that's the position group positional group that got hurt by the scheme the most. I think those guys are going to have, all of those guys are going to have career years under Vic. Like, this is going to be a, this might be the best secondary in the NFL with his coaching. And I'm not even joking. I think the safeties are phenomenal. I, I love our corners. And especially with the emergence of Cater. And I think a more zone scheme is really going to help out Xavier, who's getting a little bit older. And I think his turnovers are going to be much higher this year because he has great instincts. Um, he's going to be a phenomenal zone corner which we'll play a lot more of. And Byron Jones is the reason he even got that contract is because in Dallas, he was mainly a cover two corner. Uh, He was mainly a zone corner. Uh, And I think we'll get the most out of him too. I think that duo is going to have the best year of their career if they can keep them together. Uh, And players like Cater Coe, I mean, this defense is going to be so good this year. As long as people can stay relatively healthy. You know, we get Emmanuel Ogba back. The defensive line is going to be a lot better as well. Um, So I'm very excited about this hire. I think, and like I said, I think this really gives us a, I think, honest to God, if we can improve and add another dimension to the offense in the offseason, if that's the focus, I really do believe that we can get, get, win the division and have a home playoff game. 1,000%. Like, I really do believe that for the first time in a long time. Um, with this team and the coaching staff is, is phenomenal. Like, those two coaching both sides of the ball is going to be amazing. And to get into, and, and shout out to Steven Ross to, for landing Vic. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the things that Vic does so well is he's multiple. 
on defense. He doesn't just do one set of things. We see a lot of coordinators in the NFL kind of, all right, this is really what we do defensively. We might do a little bit of here and there, sprinkle in this, sprinkle in that. Vic is very multiple defensively. You know, you'll see a lot of cover six, cover four. You see a lot of man coverage. He's not afraid to blitz and get creative. So you don't really know as... uh, And one of the things that I really like about Vic... Let me finish my first point. You don't really know what Vic is going to do defensively. Um, And that really helps out the back end. Because the longer... And the front seven, (laughs) it helps them too. Because if you hesitate as a quarterback, you're already dead. And there was zero hesitation this past season everybody knew what we were doing it was easy to game play for the defense this you're not gonna be able to it's not it's far from easy to game plan for Vic Vangio uh and I do like that because they do Vic runs a lot more you know match coverage in terms of zone a little bit more of that a lot of quarters which is a lot of what a lot of defenses are doing and, and it and it's really really effective we see Buffalo do that a lot where they break down what you like to do and really integrate that into their coverage scheme. Um, and I think Vic does that a lot as well. So there's a lot of different things he does defensively. It, he has a Rolodex of things he likes to go to. And um, <clears throat> I think that's going to really benefit a lot of the players. And I think the scheme, and, I, and I've said this before, the scheme really fits him. I think it, you're going to see, again, I think everybody's individual numbers are going to go up. Like in Jalen Phillips... Um, for sure, and obviously he's reuniting with Bradley Chubb, so that's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> so I just think f- because quarterbacks are going to be more confused of what they're looking at, the defensive front is going to obviously get more time, and I think the secondary is talented enough to be a top string unit, if not the best in the NFL. At. There's a lot of young guys that he's going to be able to kind of get a hold of and really catapult them into their prime of their careers, especially on the very back end with the safety. So this is a massive hire. It just vastly improves the defense. I hope he's here coaching for a long time. I really hope we get to see these two coach this team for like four years. Like that, that's going to be really, really cool. And I know the deal, the deal is three years, but I just hope he doesn't retire. Like kind of like a Bill Parcells gives us one really good season and just kind of pieces out after that doesn't really I, th- I hope we kind of have him for the long the long haul how long was Bill Parcells here I, I don't know Jimmy Johnson I don't remember maybe that was could have been more than five seasons um someone will, someone will correct that but yeah they're just phenomenal coach really is I think that's it for the news. I know you guys don't care about Brian Flores being the, the Vikings coordinator. I don't think anybody cares about that. Oops, sorry. <laughs> One thing I will leave off on that is Jeff Wilson, man. Like, going back and watching some of this, these games, Raheem Mostert played a lot better as the season went on. But Jeff Wilson, dude, like, he played... He, he just had signs of, like, not good football at the end of that, that season. Um... I don't know if he was dealing with an injury or what happened, but that has got to be something they take very seriously because I did not like what I saw um, after, really after the round game. I was not impressed with him. Uh, okay, so let's get into the fan Q and A. Shout out to SM. He's the only one to, to put in. I know, you know, uh, I'm I'm, ha- I'm I'm very happy that uh, SM is is uh, uh, keeping the Q and A here. But uh, his question is, give me your list of players you're done with. Uh, honestly, I, I think the list of players I'm done with, Teddy Bridgewater, Skylar Thompson. It's hard to say I'm done with Skylar because he's such a young player, but that fourth down is just ingrained in my brain. I don't know how you don't hit Tyree Kill, who's wide open over the middle. I just don't know how that happens. And same thing in the New England game that we lost at Gillette Stadium. How in the world did Teddy Bridgewater not just look at Tyree Kill? I think, I believe it was the fourth down. Maybe it was third down. Um, who's just streaking wide open. The quarterback's played so bad down the stretch of the season. But yeah, Teddy Bridgewater and Skylar Thompson. And then I would have to say Jeff Wilson. I think those are the three that I can really only list. Nobody on the defense bothers me. Um, I think they all tried their best and 
there's not a Byron Maxwell or Ardarno or be or Phil Wheeler on the defense. Like I can't think of anybody who I'm like, Jesus, like so Um This next question comes from SM. He says, We are going to lose Mike Isiku for nothing. He will kill it with another team. Why can't we find a spot for him? He might. Like, if he goes to Denver, I think that's his best opportunity to have a really good season. Um, Maybe somewhere like Buffalo, and I hate to even put that out into the world. (laughs) But those schemes fit him. You know, very pass-happy, tight-end slot, tight-end friendly type of systems. Um, Like a Kansas City. Uh... Not even Kansas City, honestly. I don't think he fits that scheme. But those two really kind of stand out in my mind. Um, I don't care if he does well elsewhere. It's just not going to work here. And that's fine. Because the system that Mike runs is very successful. And he's not successful in it. And it is what it is. Like, I don't know what else to say. He has a significant... I will say that there were plays left on the field, especially when the season was ending, that he was not hit on. That's just, and it's not his fault, it's the quarterback's fault. But that goes for pretty much everyone else on the team. There was a lot of plays that were left out on the field the last one and a half months of the season. There was some bad stuff that was put on film. Uh, And he was, unfortunately, there there were just plays that he, that should have been hit with him that weren't. And I will say that the the last game of the year, in the playoff game, is kind of a perfect example of Mike Kosicki's career, or at least this season, is where the, he just, you know, he's wide open on a post and the ball just somehow flies right through his hands. It was just that kind of season for him. Um, and the issues with him, he can't run block. His after-the-catch stuff is terrible, which is a big deal in his offense. Um, he's not. He's just not good after the catch. He's not a, at all. He never has been. And he's a terrible route runner, which you have to be a, a, at least a good route runner in this scheme because a lot of this stuff is quick, and you have to separate quickly. He can't do that, um, and he's not good after the catch, and he can't run block. So what he just doesn't fit what we're trying to do uh, as an offense. So it is what it is. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Massive start to the offseason. I, I hope we can continue this momentum. The Dolphins have more cap space than you think. They have a lot of decisions they're going to have to make um, on some of these defensive players uh, and how they move that around. But I'm totally cool if we save some money and maybe on a Byron or an Emmanuel Ogba and use that money to continue to build around Tua and his health because that the run game has to get better. This off That has to be a... That has to be, especially in the building with Mike McDaniel and Chris Greer, they have to look at that and think, we can't average 90 yards on the ground and expect Tua to play a significant and and miss less time, basically. Like, if he misses a game or two, and hopefully it's not with the concussion, obviously. Maybe it's like a broken finger or he messes up, he bruises a rib or something like that. Um, we, We have to minimize that as much as possible. And a good run game is the best the best of friends to a pocket passing quarterback. So hopefully they can achieve that this offseason. Because again, we can't be bottom half of the league in rush yards with a pocket passing quarterback. They just we saw that with the Tampa Bay. It just it doesn't work. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh uh I'll see you guys in the next one. I don't think I mean who knows what's I think well, I guess the Super Bowl would have happened, but uh anyway, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed. See you guys in the next one.